Welcome to Introduction to Body Mechanics. My name is Lucy Napier, and I'm the Curriculum Director here at Animation Mentor, and we're all really excited to have you in this class. Body mechanics, without a doubt, has to be one of the most important things an animator can spend his or her time studying. And we've designed this class to give you a good, solid foundation to get started on that journey. Convincing body mechanics breathes life into a mass of pixels and allows the audience to take the leap into believing your animation is a real, organic thing. Really, no matter how good an actor you are, no matter how great your staging and storytelling, if your body mechanics fall flat, you'll never be able to convey the power of those stories and performances to your audience. In this class, you're going to spend the next 12 weeks studying and practicing what gives a character convincing weight, physicality, and that indescribable thing that makes a character feel like they're alive. You'll study how to use the principles of animation and apply them to body mechanics, and you'll practice by using a variety of body types. The goal of this class is to help you approach whatever character comes your way, no matter how many muscles or legs he or she might have, with a sensible approach to breaking down the movement and applying solid body mechanics, and still make it an entertaining and engaging shot for your audience to see. Before we start you on your way, though, with these new rigs and maybe new body types that you've never tried before, I found this really great quote from Rembrandt. I'm going to read it to you. Start with the things that you know, and the things that are unknown will be revealed to you. I like that idea. We're building on these things iteratively. What you already know, we're going to build on and just push it a little bit further. But don't feel like you're starting absolutely from scratch. From the Dutch master Rembrandt, we're going to move into the 21st century with a modern animation master, a friend of animation mentors, Tom Gibbons, who was talking about how almost everything you need to know is in the bouncing ball. I'm Tom Gibbons. I'm an animation supervisor at Tippett Studio. And I just want to talk to you for a few minutes about some principles of animation, one of them being the most basic ball bounce. I've been doing animation for 20 years and have just recently made a lot of discoveries about wall bounces and I can't say how much I believe people don't know about them. The principles behind something as simple as a ball bounce can carry you all the way through a, a full-on creature animation simply by knowing the principles of how a ball falls, the physics and the gravity behind it, and then applying those same rules that you would learn off of that to a creature that you're animating, whether that creature is stylized or the Kraken from Clash of the Titans. Knowing how muscle mass, weight, physics all act on a creature that you're animating is vital, and the ball bounce is the simplest way to start to understand and experiment with those principles. Don't sell it short. Pay attention to it. And if I could say anything to anyone, it's that you can't ever stop learning about what it is that's out there in your medium that you're working with and what you're working on. Since Rembrandt and Tom Gibbons cannot be wrong, I will vouch for both of them, make sure you take the time this week to review the 12 principles of animation in The Illusion of Life by Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson. The 12 principles of animation are really the foundation of how we teach animation at Animation Mentor, and we'll be using those terms a lot throughout this class and all the classes to come. I have a friend at Blue Sky who calls animating walks the figure drawing of animation. What he meant by that was is that we should never stop practicing our walks, just the same way that animators need to always carry around a sketchbook and constantly be observing life and jotting down quick poses and even longer poses, we should all be continuing to push ourselves with walks because, frankly, they're not easy. And if we're good at what we do, we'll always be pushing ourselves so that they continue to challenge us, continue to make our animation that much better. So for this week, we're starting you off with a full body walk in this lecture. This lecture is going to be a unique one. What we're going to do is have me jumping in on Maya, 
while Dr. Elizabeth Riga, a physiologist and also a consultant in animation, discusses the specifics of the anatomy and physiology of a walk. So you'll see us cutting back and forth between the science and the art, and hopefully the combination of the two will help you gain new insights, workflow tips, and ideas for your walks as you continue on your path to learning strong body mechanics and improving as an animator. Before we get started in the lecture, I want to remind you all that this is one way to do things with the animating a walk. At AM, we try to show you a variety of workflow techniques, a variety of theories so that you can find the one that resonates with you, with a particular shot or character that you're working on, and to give you a full set of tools and skills in your arsenal to approach any shot or character. Also, Dr. Riga is a scientist. So take what she's saying with a grain of salt in that context. Remember that animation is the illusion of life. We're not rotoscoping here, and we're not trying to teach you literal anatomy, but hopefully to give you a little more background on how the body works in order to make your animation that much stronger. At the end of the day, do as your mentor directs you to do. If your mentor has a note that might contradict how the lecture presents some content, Always go with what your mentor directs you to do, just as you would on a regular show on production when your supervising animator or your director gives you a note. All right, enough talk. Let's get started. The layout ring is something you're familiar with. It's this ring down here at the base of the rig. This is something that you do not animate. Um, this is something that you want to set and forget at the beginning of your shot. And remember that when you're setting this, you want to put it on an axis and in a place that is where the majority of your action is taking place. So let's say that Stella is going to be walking in cross axis here and then falling to her knees and screaming Stella. Well, we'd want to set that layout ring in that vicinity so that we can keep our our curves as clean as we can for as long as we can for the most intricate movement of your shot. The layout ring is also where you need to uh, set the resolution. So when you go over here, uh, it's <coughs> body resolution. It comes in at low. You can also set it to proxy and you'll notice that when proxy comes on, this X at the bottom also turns on. Try clicking on that, and you'll see that you can go through and hide pieces of Stella if you need to, to work on your animation. This is especially helpful for hiding the arms if you are, say, doing a really intricate movement and just want to fix, uh, focus on the core body movements. You can even go as far as to turn off the legs, too, and really focus on that core play with it. It's a great option and uh, again you can only access that by having her in proxy mode and then this X will show up. Now when we go into the low or the high you'll notice that all of the head controls will come on too. In proxy just the the bare minimum will turn on but when you go into low or high resolution you'll see that the rest of the controls will come on. This includes, I love this, this is the new squash and stretch control for the head. And you actually have two here. This is the one on top. And that one, the pivot point is kind of at the base of her skull there. The second pivot point is this one near her jawline. So that you can counter with something that it looks like the pivot point is um, as if there's a circle above her ears going around her eyes in that plane of the face. This is going to give you so much flexibility to really get some interesting uh, dynamics to your animation and to your poses. And you'll see that you have the blinks control. Um, Stella just has those uh, little orphan Annie style eyes so uh, you don't really need eye direction, but you do have a lot of flexibility with the blinks. Also, you'll notice that her ponytails have these really cool controls on it to give you lots of opportunity to apply what you've learned about 
overlap, follow through, all that cool stuff that you learned with Taylor. Notice it's kind of the same shape. <laughs> You'll notice here too that um, in the head controls, there's a follow a line. Now I know a most of you already know what this is, but I just want to go over it in case there's a few of you who have questions about it. When follow a line is on, that means that it's going to keep her head oriented, even when you're doing super crazy things with the body. So it's going to keep her head pretty level and let you just sweeten it there on top. When you have the head align off, or the follow align off, that means when you are animating the rest of her body, you're going to have to do a lot of counter animation in the head. And sometimes you need to do that. So it, it might seem like you're a waste of time, <laughs> but you will find yourself in situations where it will be much simpler and you will have more control over your animation if that head align is off. Underneath this, you'll notice a new control, and uh, it's the gimbal control. Gimbal control is so awesome. For those of you who are familiar with animating with offsets, this is having the offset access built in. So if I turn this on, you'll notice that another ring just came in. That means in the hierarchy, this is another control just below the main head control. Why would you want to do this? Well, it's exactly what the controller is called. It's to prevent gimbal lock. So I want you guys to think about Spider-Man right now. Spider-Man flying between buildings and doing crazy twists and leaps and flips. When you do that and really mess around with going off axis, you can get into trouble pretty fast. The gimbal control is designed so that you can parse out your rotations and even your translations sometimes. I've only used it for rotations. So say you're about to do something really crazy, lots of flips, you might just do your Y rotation on the main head control. And then on the inner one, on the gimbal control, you just do your uh, Z and X or vice versa. So it's just a way to to parse things out to give yourself more control. If you do do that, make a commitment. Only, you know, if you do do Y rotations just on the uh, main head control ring, only do Y on that. Don't start mixing it up or you're going to have a big tangled bowl of spaghetti by the end. So keep it real clean and simple. That's what this is here for. So let's move down to the spine. And I'm going to start with the center of gravity here. The center of gravity, you'll notice too, I'll just start with the same thing we just talked about. We have the gimbal control here, which is awesome, because this is the place where I find that I need that gimbal control the most, is to get me out of binds with really intricate body mechanics and physical shots. I also want to point out another control here that I'm super excited about, sculpt controls. So let's turn those on and you'll see <coughs> That these are just like they sound. They're they're fine sculpt controls if you have to get in there for any reason and do that. I I wouldn't recommend doing that off out of the gate. I think most of it. This is uh, uh, the geometry has been worked with the rig very very nicely. So don't do it for that. But this is how I would use it. This is how I am going to use it. I just created a cube. Let's scale that up a little bit. Now I'm gonna pretend like she needs to have, let's say she's an action hero and she needs to put a secret weapon on her belt. So we're going to just go ahead and constrain that there and voila. If I need to do a quick constraint, we already have those point, these uh, sculpt controls on to do that with. It's a really, really cool thing to have in there. And uh, I think you guys will get a kick out of it. Now, the, uh, the cog controls has everything that you would expect to. The translates, rotates, the squash and stretch. But check this out. Look, she breathes. Very cool. Now, make sure that when you use the breath control, 
you need to engage the entire core body. This is just meant to be the icing on top of the cake, but when you're animating breath, look at reference. It's really a combination of different controls. So it's also a little bit of the up down when she's taking a breath in. She needs to be rotated up in her chest with a little bit there. Her shoulders would also be rising just a little bit. We'll get into the shoulders in just a second. <clears throat> the point being, just don't leave them. Never animate something in the body without having the other parts of the body animating with it. The body is an organic thing. All of these things are, are interrelated. So let me go ahead and put the breath exhale here. And then we would have this rotated back down a little bit. That's going to be too much, guys. I'm doing this on the fly. So forgive me here. But just for demonstration purposes. There we go. So her breath would be a combination of controls. So we've gone over the scalp controls, the gimbal of the cog, the free spine controls. If you ever need to uh, get in there and get lots of little detail, um, the free spine controls are in there. Use that with discretion, guys. That's, that's uh, just for very, very fine, detailed work. And I have to say that the FK controls on here are pretty robust, and there won't be many situations where that will happen. Speaking of FKIK controls on the spine, you'll notice here there is a switch in the cog control that's IK and FK. This is really cool. When it comes in, you're going to have both. So you'll have both the uh, FK controllers that we were just, or excuse me, the IK controllers that we were just playing with. And you can also do FK work on that too. One word of advice on uh, the IK-FK controllers both being on, generally speaking, it's good to commit to one or the other being the base of your controls. In other words, if you're going to do the bulk of your, your posing on the, in the IK controls, I would just switch it off to just IK, get her into her main poses there, and then you can sweeten it with a little bit of the FK on top. Um, for me personally, I like to start with the FK controls, get as much of the posing and the movement in as I can with those FK controls, and then turn on the IK on top of that so you can sweeten the pose and put in that. It, it's especially nice for polishing and getting in that last final 10%. We'll start with going over the FK controls here on the spine. And this is mostly like how you'd expect it. So the cog you can um, rotate, and it's going to rotate from the hips, which is where rotation happens on a human figure through that ball and socket joint at the, at the hips. And you have your spine controls a lot like how you would expect them to move. But I want to point out the, the uh, hip FK control here. This is really cool. And um, it has a little more control to it than you might be used to. So this one, first of all, rotates from the waist. So keep that in mind. You have the cog control that's going to be rotating from the hips. And then this hip control that's rotating from the waist. And uh, d just keep that in mind. Again, there's going to be different scenarios where each one will come in handy, but try to keep it as clean as you can and make those choices very consciously. The other really cool thing about the hips is if you do not want to do a mix between FK and IK, you can have her in FK and still have some of the juicy yumminess of being in the IK-FK combo which is really pretty groovy because uh, you can keep it a little bit simpler without adding both of those on top. Uh, excuse me, without adding the IK on top. 
Moving on to the IK controls, so let's put it in, in IK here. Um, there are three main controls in the IK spine, and I want to point out the third one. We've already kind of gone over the hips, and we have the chest. Here, let me change that. There's four. <laughs> so there's the neck. The fourth one here is the curvature control. This is cool. The curvature control is going to be um, controlling that mid part of her body. Now check out what else this curvature control can do. So we've just been playing with it. I'm, I'm only going to use the translate X. So we've just been playing with it where the midsection is isolated. That's going to be a great control for you. It, you know, say she's crawling on the ground or climbing a tree. Those kinds of situations I could totally totally see you be in the IK spine and this is going to give you lots of control to get the right line of action going through her core body the really the most important part of the body for convincing body mechanics in there these curvature top and curvature bottom controls are pretty interesting let me turn okay so just to review this is where we are now <laughs> side to side in isolation now check this out. If I turn on the curvature top, now it's affecting the top part of her. We're still just moving that center part, but the uh, the curvature top is moving along with it, is reacting to it. That's a pretty powerful control. And then likewise, we'll turn this one off, the top off, and turn on the bottom. Now the hips are reacting with it. Use that with discretion and just at the very end of your polish pass, make sure that your core body movements are built into the controller at that area. So the hips, if you want to get a movement similar to that, it would be a little bit of X translation and some, oops, excuse me, Z rotation. And then you can just build that in on top of it with that curvature control um, to really sweeten it. So a lot of these advanced controllers that are coming in for you are really for the advanced stages of your workflow just to sweeten at the very end to add that last 10%. Finally, let's go through the limbs here, the arms and the legs. So to go from FK to IK or IK to FK, select this little sphere at her fingertips and you'll see at the bottom here in the channel box, snap IK to FK to FK. What the heck does that mean? Well, first of all, you can just simply go, right now her arms are in FK. Let's go to IK and you'll notice that a little controller here shows up on her wrist. So now we can move her just the way you would expect an IK arm to move. Well, what if you want to pose something or you've been parenting something to her arm and it needed to be in IK? But then you want to snap back to FK. Well, right now she is in IK and I've just done really just such a gorgeous pose with that arm. I'm being facetious. Now we can go select that little sphere again and we're going to snap IK to FK and it maintains the pose that we set in IK and we can go ahead and adjust that pose however we need. It's really cool. I mean it's just so cool that it's all built in right there. So have fun with that and uh, don't be so afraid to go from IK to FK because this this rig has a lot of your uh, controls just right there at your fingertips to make it easier for you. So while we're in IK, let me go through uh, a few of the things here. These are your uh, elbow PV controllers. So um, that's for adjusting here. Let me put the elbow in here a little bit more to make this clearer. So that's for adjust adjusting the branch rotation of the arms when she's in IK. Um, you can turn those off. 
I find particularly with blocking sometimes it's very hard to chase down those PV controllers. So for me, I like to turn those off while I'm blocking. Um, so that's when you select the main IK control at her wrist and here PV control on and off. Arm twist is kind of an alternative to uh, the PV controls. So I would strongly recommend either using the, P the PV controls or the arm twist. When you start mixing it up, you're just gonna really have a mess when you're doing your cleanup. So make a commitment and either do the arm twist or the PV controls. And then here's the, the controllers that you're used to seeing, the translates and rotates. You'll notice at the very bottom here that we have the same control that you've seen before with the, uh, the gimbal lock control. This is really, really cool. This is giving you another offset like we've talked about on the other rigs. So on the inside, you have that offset that's gonna be really handy for you doing constraints, really handy for you if you're doing very complex movements that are going off axes to keep your curves clean uh, in the same recommended way that I was talking about with the cog and the head. Here we have the space. Now what does that mean? This has to do with how the uh, controller is following. Right now it's at root, which is essentially world space. So it, when I have it in there, if I move her body, her hand will stay behind because it's following in the world space. But I can have her in IK here. Right now her arm's in FK, that's why it was following before. But I can have this follow the cog. So when I select the cog, her hand is an IK, but it's following with the cog there. So I want to point out to you these, that's, that's something you're probably used to, is having it either be in the world space or in the cog space. Check these out, though. I really like these. So if I put her hand in the space of her spine end, watch this. So her hands on her hip, we've set a key there. I've selected her, her IK controller for that hand and I'm gonna set it to spine end and now I'm selecting her hips. Now they're gonna move together and you're not gonna have to set up a special constraint system. Wow, that's gonna save you time because there's a lot of times where hands will be on hips. Now, if I set this hand to head, now, if I select the hand control, one is following the other, which is super cool. Again, for um, saving you the time of setting up another complicated, either parent constraint setup or other kind of constraint setup. So play with that, and you can animate that on and off to different spaces. All right, so now let's go into the FK arm. I want to point out to you here too that there is an FKIK blend. Um, I kind of skip over that quickly because I never use blends between FK and IK. If your mentor has some great tips or tricks with that, oh boy, ask that mentor in your Q&A. Um, for me, I just like to go from IK to FK in a single frame and keep it super clean, but that's just a personal preference and I'm just pointing it out to you that it's there if you want to play with it. Uh, let's go in and check out the controls that you have with the uh, FK tool, the FK controllers here. With any movement, as I said before, with the breath, if you move the arm up, say I want to rotate her arm up here in FK, you would never, ever, ever just rotate that arm up. You also will need to move that arm up a little bit probably rot rotate that shoulder to adjust it. Rotate the core body movement to give it a more organic feel. I, I, I would even <laughs> make sure that I, I was dealing with the, uh, the head and the neck too to give that uh, just a little bit 
of reaction to the arm raising up. So never, ever, ever raise a single body part without having the reaction of the others around it. So I'm just moving her center of balance over a little bit to accommodate that shoulder. So that's using, with that arm control, I I just can't emphasize this enough to make sure you understand where that movement's coming from, where it's going to with any any movement. So that's that's kind of how I would have that arm going up. So you have this shoulder controller that's on top of the FK controls for that arm. And then this is the chain going down. This is the root of the chain, the uh, the shoulder um, up arm. You have the elbow and the wrist. Again, just a uh, repeat, just like with the IK, you do have the gimbal controls here too. Um, the PV control, again, you can turn on and off here. Same thing with the arms. If you, you the uh, leg twist, it's a little bit further up here. In the hands, it's more obvious because the PV control and the arm twist are in the same place, but make a commitment to one or the other. They kind of do the same, they do a similar job of rotating, you know, kind of branch selecting that chain and rotating it. Um, so make a commitment to one or the other. Uh, and it also has the expected controls here of the translates and rotates. Now, speaking of rotates, there's a foot roll here, which is a probably very similar to what you're used to working with. And I, I want to recommend that for most walking and locomotion type movements, you can get a lot of the core action with that foot roll before you start adding on the rotations on top of that. So for walks and things like that, I try to get as much as you can with the foot roll and then add those on just as the sweetening at the end. Uh, when you're doing your polishing. You also have toe controls here. So if you're doing a push off, you can drag that toe behind with the toe control. You have another spot. Uh, this is super, super cool, you guys. <laughs> you have the, uh, the toe raise here. So if you don't want the foot roll, you can have it actually pivot from the toe. Um, and here's uh, pivoting the twist of the foot, pivoting from the toe again, or pivoting from the ball of the foot, pivoting from the heel of the foot. These are great, great controls. The square at the base of her foot is where you're going to get... Um, the, again, very similar to the, how it's set up in the hand. You have the FK-IK blend. You can do the same trick with the uh, IK to FK that I demonstrated with the arms. This is really cool. You can also just stretch the top of the leg or the lower leg. That is going to come in so handy or the entire leg. Another thing that I want to show you here, this, these are, again, these are advanced polish controls. Don't, don't use these until you've exhausted all the other possibilities. Hip visibility control. So I have this square controller at the base of the foot selected, and I'm going to turn on the hip control. Woof! This is a great polisher here, guys. This is a very fine controller where you can get um, out of a lot of binds, this is something that I would use uh, if she were, let's say she were squatting way down low. Sometimes you get into a little bit of a bind here. The, uh, the way things are surfaced around shoulders and hips can get tricky. So I could see some scenarios where you might need to just just pull that out just the tiniest bit to clean that up in your polish pass at the very, very end. Another really great polish thing are the binbo controls. Let's turn the binbo controls on. 
and you can get really, really fine shapes in there if you want to get in there and do some very specific things to get your line of action even sweeter than you could without. It's also a really cool way to get the illusion of muscle jiggle. So if you're doing like a really hard hit and you need to have that uh, persistence of the motion kind of settle in the body, this is a cool place to do it. They also have these in the arms. So if I turn on the sphere at the at her fingertips, there's also the Benbo controls here on the arms. Have fun with this rig, you guys. We can't wait to see what you come up with in your animation shots. Well, let's get started getting Stella moving here. I'm gonna start blocking a vanilla walk moving through space and uh, at the same time, I'm going to be reviewing some pointers on posing. So, of course, the first thing we always do is hone our observation. And in this case, I shot some video reference of my friend Alicia. And I just asked her to take the most neutral stance she could while she was walking so we could observe what's going on between the relationship of her hips to her stride and the uh, shoulders to the hips. Uh, seeing this from the back, you can really get a lot of good reference there of how the hips are moving with the shoulders. One point I want to remind you guys of, speaking of posing, is the Italian term, the contraposta. And uh, if you'll recall, contraposta is how basically you're loosening up the body. Uh, a lot of people think of... Uh, it being just the hips and the shoulders in opposition, but I actually found this really great definition, and they said a rep contraposta is a representation of the human body in which the forms are organized on a varying or curving axis to provide an asymmetrical balance to the figure. I really like that definition because it's not just talking about the hips and the shoulders, it's talking about the entire form being in a curving or varying access to bring asymmetry or a more organic, loose quality to the body. The walk, the, the human walk is a great example of just that on a very subtle level. The hips are moving in opposition of the shoulders. And you can really see that here when she's going, uh, facing towards the camera and walking away from the camera. can really see the hips dropping here, dropping over the swing through leg, and then her weight shifting over onto the new supporting leg. It's really a lot going on in those hips. And then at the same time, bringing an asymmetrical balance to the figure, we see the chest moving in opposition to those hips and the arms swinging in opposition to bring, again, an asymmetrical balance. So you can really see how the contrapposto, posto, sorry for all of my Italian friends out there for butchering your language. Uh, <laughs> you can really see how this classic Italian art term applies to what we're doing here this week with the basic walk. So what I'm looking at here is the mechanics of her push off of the weight shift from one leg to the other. Here's the extreme up pose going into the contact. Contact's gonna be our key, if you recall. And her back knee is slightly bent and you see a really stiff locked leg there in the front. They have a nice setup for a contrast. Going into the slight bend, you can see her body taking the weight as it pushes off and it swings through. So I'm looking for the stride length. I'm looking at the keys. Let's go watch her in the other direction again here just to analyze the footage. So here's her contact pose. That's a key. And there's the extreme down. You can see the, the leg slightly bent and her height going down a little bit. There's the pass pose, which will be our breakdown. 
into the extreme up, which is right at the precipice before she goes into the next contact pose. When I say the precipice, it's, uh, if you'll recall, uh, walks are just often described as a series of controlled falls. So that extreme up pose is the height. There she is at the height. I'm looking at the top of her head here, right before she goes down into the contact pose again. So keep this, this reference footage handy for you to refer back to as you're blocking and uh, animating through to polish on your shot. The first thing that you need to do is make sure that you have a ground plane in your scene. It's super important with making that convincing ground contact, the push-offs and all the other good stuff you're gonna put into your walk. For my walk here, I'm doing a vanilla walk, and an animation mentor, a vanilla walk just means a very neutral, nondescript walk where you're exploring the mechanics more so than you're exploring the character. Um, also, I'm gonna be animating this from all angles, not just from one locked off perspective or orthographic view. And for me getting started on this demo, I'm gonna be hiding the arms. So I'll go ahead and do that as I showed you earlier and we're going to put the body into proxy and then select the proxy node, the X there at her feet, and I'm going to turn the arms off. Again, just to keep it simple, we'll just focus on the strides and the hips to start with. My philosophy of blocking is to keep it as simple as you can, as long as you can, so I am just, I'm not even gonna call this blocking pass yet. This is really just kind of putting a pace to the footfalls. The, so I'm just using the foot control with the foot roll and the translates. I really recommend staying with the foot roll as long as you can. There's a lot you can get out of it. And if you make this the base of how you move the feet, of how you pose the feet, and then layer on top of it more of the sweetening controls, I think you'll have a lot easier time of it and have a lot nicer animation and poses as a result. So I'm just roughing these in, making sure that front leg has that nice straight like we like on the contacts. So these are the keys or the, the contact poses. And I wanna have a straight leg on the front and kind of a bent leg on the back to give it that feeling of pushing off. Just gonna have her lean a little bit forward and pull her down just a tiny bit. I'm also putting a tiny rotation on the body just to give her more of that feeling of the direction she's going to. I had a great illustration teacher one time who told me with my still drawings, these were for illustrations, not for animation, he said, always make your drawings feel like they have a sense of where they're coming from and where they're going to. Make sure that that picture is telling the story of the action. He wasn't an animator, but he should have been an animator because that's exactly what we need to be thinking about with these poses. So again, walks are pretty subtle posing, but there's a lot of stuff going on here. So we want to have that in the pose, and that's why I have her bent a little bit forward there. Now I'm grabbing the hips. And um, super important to have that Y rotation in the hips. See how it's affecting the, the pose in the leg already just with that little bit. So I'm gonna have this, gonna experiment here with widening the stride just a tiny bit to get that leg stride, uh, straight, but not popping. So, and then my chest, I have a little bit of rotation in there too to get that uh, contraposta feel that loosening of the axis uh, as we talked about earlier. There's still so much to do with this, so we've, we're keeping it simple on purpose, but what looks wrong with this picture? Well, to me, her stride's just so wide. No one would walk that way. You know, a, a woman typically has the feet closer together under her body. That's a term called tracking. Um, and you'll, you'll really get excited about this when you get into animals because it's fascinating how close under their body they are, or how wide apart. Certainly it's true for bipeds too, or two-legged walks. So, so we, need, we still need to figure that stuff out. We still need to do a heck of a lot more with the hips and the trunk of the body. 
So I think this might be a good time to take a break and listen to what Dr. Elizabeth Riga has to say about the physiology of a walk. Hopefully that can inform us on uh, the next stages that we'll go through in blocking our walk. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Riga and I'm a professor of anatomy at Western University of Health Sciences and I'm also a consultant for the animation industry. Hello, today's lecture is on locomotion and one of the great things about human locomotion is that it is true everywhere is within walking distance if you have enough time. And the reason that this particular statement is so apt about human locomotion is that energetically speaking, Human locomotion via walking is a really easy way to save energy and be efficient. Um, And it's very different than the kind of locomotor systems that you see in animals, um, and particularly animal walking is really not broadly comparable to human walking. So I'm going to talk to you about what turns out to be, for human beings, one of the most unique things that we do. Um, Not our hands, turns out to be our feet. And I really like this very first image because it shows you a very typical progression through the human evolutionary stages of walking, um, and some of which is is not necessarily particularly correct, but I really like this end phase. First of all, uh, this image I have to give credit to Dr. Stuart Sumita and PowerPoint crafted these images together, and of course our president. But what I want to also point out is that if you take a look at the position of his knees, this is what turns out to be really critically important, is that the locked knee is the key to understanding the human walking mechanism. Everything is really going to proceed from there. Okay. Now I will talk to you just very briefly about running, only to differentiate it. And one of the reasons that running turns out to be um, extremely important is that we look at essentially a floating phase in running. This is what's going to differentiate it from walking. So I've got two quadrupedal examples right here. Uh, We've got a horse at the top and as a characteristic herbivore, and we've got a carnivore, a sort of panther-looking sort of indeterminate feline kind of animal at the bottom. What I want you to notice in both of these is that there is a floating phase. So we have a floating phase here where the horse's legs are gathered. Notice that there is an extended phase, but at least one, and in this picture, two of the hooves are on the ground. And the reason for that is this is an herbivore. Herbivores are big, heavy-bodied animals that eat plants, not meat. And if you're a plant eater, your gut has to be huge because you have to ferment this food. As a consequence, your backbone has to be stiff. And look at the profile of the horse backbone there. Gathered phase, floating phase, they're both straight backbone. That's what makes horses convenient to ride. The difference with carnivore running is that you can see the backbone is bendy. So the carnivore has a gathered phase, which is floating above the substrate, and it also has an extended phase, which is floating. And that means that, in fact, with the carnivore backbone, they are using their backbone to increase the extension of their gait, therefore ending up running faster. Why can carnivores do this? This is apologies to the vegetarians, but meat is actually easy to digest. Therefore, your gut is a lot shorter, and we're talking the difference between maybe 35 feet and seven feet. So you can have a bendy backbone. So you can have a different kind of locomotor style. Where are humans here? Humans are kind of intermediate because our backbone will be rigid during locomotion and flexible during locomotion in different planes. I want to set this kind of up as a way of thinking about the fact that the backbone is really intimately involved in locomotion. It's not just the limbs moving. Now, as another kind of point of comparison, remember that most animals that we think of are tetrapods, four limbs on the ground. We are tetrapods too, but in the sense we have freed up our upper pods, our hands, for a different function, and therefore we are bipeds. Now, we tend to think of bipedal locomotion as being Um, uniquely human. And it's not. Look out your window, look at the birds, right? They're bipedal. Or for those of you that are big dinosaur fans, most, many dinosaurs are bipedal and certainly the earliest dinosaurs were bipedal. So bipedal, not so special. What's really special is the backbone. See, we're back to the backbone again. And it means that the backbone is, in humans, orthograde. So it's straight, you can see that. Whereas for most tetrapods, they are going to have a pronograde posture. Their backbone is here, our backbone, oriented 90 degrees, is up. That is what's truly special then, the combination of the bipedal locomotion as well as the orthograde posture. And I like these examples a lot because, um, I mean, we all love Calvin and Hobbes and we miss Bill Watterson. 
And Bill Watterson was great at observation because sometimes Hobbes is kind of a guy in a cat suit. Sometimes Hobbes really is an animal. And you can see his tiger form here. And look at him with his bendy backbone. And he has a floating phase, which is gathered, and a floating phase, which is extended. So here he's definitely in his tiger phase. The bottom one I put on here is that as a consequence of our posture, remember our orthograde or upright posture combined with our bipedal locomotion, we have something that most animals don't have, and that is a butt. And so that's why Calvin's thinking, you know, our butts are fine, but they're a very unusual feature in the animal kingdom. So not only is the butt marking a particular position of muscle mass, it's also marking um, a, a convenient, if um, unfortunate, fat storage area. So upright posture. And, and I, what I want to show you here by point of comparison is what would happen if we took human hip bones and made them into more tetrapodal, pronograde, horizontal hip bones. So what you have on the left is the upright posture, and you can see it's really a section through the backbone down through one of the hip bones. So you'll see the curve of the sacrum as you come down like this. And you'll also note, and this turns out to be critically important for artists, you must look at the position of the hips. Most people like to think that your hips are square on. They're not. They are rotated down so that your pubis is inferior to your ilium. Really important for pelvic orientation, and we will be talking about the effect of pelvic orientation because that is an important determinant of creating a realistic gait. So you can see the upright posture, and what I'll show you here is just some of the implications that it has for the efficiency of our locomotion. With our locomotion, one of the major propellers for running is a hamstring, hamstring muscles in the back of your thigh. And note their green sort of trajectory. That's the path they take down the back of the thigh. And this little dotted line is essentially the lever arm to the center of the acetabulum. The acetabulum's the hip joint where the femoral head comes in and contacts the hip. That's where we're going to have, obviously, a lot of locomotor action involved. And look at that compared to what you can see here in a more quadrupedal position. So imagine taking yourself and sprinting and being down in the runner's blocks. You're running, right? How do you put your backbone? You try to put it as much like a quadrupedal animal as possible. Or think about riding a bike. I mean, I know when I ride a bike, I'm kind of grandma quadriceps sitting up on my little beach cruiser kind of thing. But if you're really serious about going fast, your vertebral column is parallel to the bar of the bike. And look what that does to the effective lever arm of the hamstrings. All of a sudden, that lever arm is much more mechanically advantageous. Therefore, it's showing you that the muscles around our hips are primarily organized for a different posture than that which we have evolutionarily been given. Why would you do that? Well, we're back to the beginning. Walking in humans, extremely important. It's probably the reason why we are successful and have overrun the entire world. Because we can't run very fast, but we can walk pretty far. And we can walk pretty far without a lot of energetics in it. So we'll find that walking is a system of controlled falls where you're looking to mem minimize the energetics that are going into the system. So that's kind of the point. We can outwalk our prey, but we can't outrun them. I know I can't even outrun your average chicken, sadly. It is true. There are a variety of anatomical adaptations to upright posture. And in this lecture, I'll be going through the eight of these. Um, one of those I've mentioned already then, the, the rotation at the hip. If you take a look at this, do you notice the backbone? We're going back now to a slide. So we're going back to that vertebral orientation. Do you notice that the lordosis, the curve of the backbone, doesn't change appreciably? What is changing? Where are you rotating in order to stand up? It's important to remember you're not rotating at your lower back you are rotating at your hip joint. So we have rotated essentially 90 degrees around our hip joint. And so one of those adaptations to upright posture is you simply rotate around your hip, not around your lower back. So rotation at the hip is one of our first important adaptation to upright posture. Secondly, you've got anterior-posterior compression of the thorax. Anterior-posterior simply means front and back. It's important to say that because in animals that orientation is head to toe. For us, it's front to back this way. And what we have done is rather than having a chest that's out here, 
So if we were a quadruped, we would be quite keel-shaped in cross-section. We are more, as human beings, kind of jelly bean-shaped. It brings our center of mass over our hips and over our two feet. And that also minimizes the energetics that you have to put into the system. So an illustration, here's that kind of jelly bean cross-section that you'll see through the thorax. You see where the vertebral column is and where possible we are trying to center our mass so that it in fact does pass through the knee joint, the ankle joint, and then down to the foot to be distributed. So it's like stacking up teacups. Broadening of the pelvic girdle, pelvic girdle, your hip bones. Your hip bones, instead of being narrow points of muscle attachment, also have to become supporting mechanisms, and therefore they are going to broaden and change their configuration, and we'll be going through that in more detail. Attachment of the tail muscles. Our tail is not vestigial. We have a tailbone, and there's a reason we have a tailbone, and that has to do with supporting our guts. Now, this is one of my favorite adaptations because it's one of those hidden things, and yet it is so very important. Here is your tailbone, right there. And your tailbone is oriented forward toward your pubis. And all of these muscles right here, okay, pubococcygeus muscle, um, iliococcygeus, ischiococcygeus muscle, these are all tail wagging muscles except that we have taken our tail and we've oriented it forward and we've created essentially a hammock out of our former tail wagging muscles to support our guts because our orientation has changed. Remember the backbone like this? Well, we have a nice mesentery as tetrapods that supports your guts. But once you change the orientation of your vertebral column, those guts are going to sag. What's going to support them? Well, you're going to take your tail muscles, you're going to attach them forward, and therefore it means that when you stand up and sneeze, you're not prolapsing your rectum, which I think we would all kind of agree is a really convenient feature of human locomotion and posture. We have a lateral stability complex, so I'll be speaking about the system of muscle and ligament and tendon that go down the lateral aspect of our body, the side from hip all the way past the knee. Um, and that is going to be essential for modulating our gait. Lumbar curvature, we'll talk about the effect that the curve of the lower back has on the pelvic posture. And then knee locking, absolutely essential for normal human locomotion is the concept. Unlike running, in human walking, your knee should be locking, and we're going to be using really our lower limb as a propulsive strut. And that, that includes the foot, so rather than having a nice grasping organ, we're going to have to turn our foot into really a strut that doesn't interfere with the inverted pendulum that is human walking locomotion. Okay, so one of the consequences that we have of having a ball and socket hip joint, which is very mobile, um, but it's also very expensive to maintain stability over that. So imagine as you're walking that you're walking on banana peels. Okay. If you don't have stabilization, um, you are not going to have effective motion transfer as you move forward. So the idea is that around the hip, we have to introduce a whole series of structures that allow what is essentially a beam of our pelvis. If we describe the pelvis from acetabulum to acetabulum, in fact, what you have is a beam. And when we're standing on one foot, that beam has to be balanced. And we are actively balancing that beam by contracting the lateral portion of it. And where is the axis of motion? You may think it's around the vertebral column, but where you're going to sag around that beam is that femoral head. So we've got a whole series of muscular and ligamentous structures here to counteract that tendency toward pelvic tilt that happens when you unweight a foot. And that's where this turns out to be just incredibly important. So this lateral stability complex is very defining for human walking locomotion because it allows us to balance the beam of that pelvis. And this shows you a little bit of a different perspective on the same idea. So here is your vertebral column. Here is your sacrum and your hip bones attached to it. Notice with the unweighted foot, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but these muscles your gluteus medius and your gluteus minimus, part of your lateral stability complex, are basically allowing you to stand up without tilting your pelvis significantly. And this is characteristic of normal adult locomotion, normal kid locomotion, and we'll see later a little less characteristic of toddlers 
because they haven't developed this complex yet, and therefore toddler walking will look different than normal human adult walking. This is a point where I'd actually like to stand up and have you at home do a little demonstration. So I have a, a demonstration uh, that I'd like to do with you right now. So I'm going to need everybody to stand up, get your desk chairs out of the way, give yourself a little bit of room. Um, one of the things that I want to emphasize is the fact that, again, our pelvis can be modeled as a beam. And I'm putting my hands right over the location of those acetabula. Remember that, that femoral hip joint with the ball and socket. And what I want you to do right now is to go ahead and balance on one foot. And I want you to notice that, in fact, your pelvis will stay relatively horizontal as mine is. Okay? You're not tilting this way. You're not tilting that way. You're actually able to lift a foot and pretty much keep the beam of your pelvis horizontal. Now, that doesn't mean that during normal walking you wouldn't dip a little bit on that side. But you don't dip anywhere near the degree that you would if you didn't have that gluteus maximus and medius lateral stability complex. So take a break for a second. Hopefully you've not fallen over. I want you to do that again. Plant a foot. Think about the foot you're going to stand on. And at the same time, go to the top of your ilium, the bony ridge right along the side here, and then take your fingers and go down from that. So if you place it like this, you ought to be at about the right place. That big pad of muscle is your gluteus medius and minimus plus the top of that iliotibial tract. So if you do that again, and stand, I want you to feel how those muscles have tensed up. You can actually feel the muscle contraction and now actively concentrate on releasing it. And you see how the beam of the pelvis sags. So those muscles, which we don't think about, that you can't see visually from the exterior, have a tremendous effect on balancing on something that you do see, which is the pelvis and the foot swing. So keep in mind that we've got that to pull us up and keep our pelvis level. Now, if we have a nerve that's damaged to these or muscle paralysis or don't have hip bones oriented like this, like a chimpanzee, then you're going to have to walk like this because you have to balance your center of mass above your foot as opposed to... So that's a real human hallmark. That is humanity in terms of locomotion. And one of the things that we see, which we'll talk about later, is that little kids up to about 18 months have to do this because they don't have that complex developed in the same orientation, nor do they have the coordination. And it has a whole series of knock-on effects from the foot all the way up to the back that changes the way that the muscles are acting, and it certainly changes the angles of the joint. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Let's see what we can apply to our walk from what we learned with Dr. Riga. First of all, she was talking about how walking is one of the most efficient things a human can do, that our prey might be able to outrun us, but they can't outwalk us. It's something I didn't know. Some of those things that make that adaptation possible are things like rotating from the hips. Now, we have that going pretty well with Stella. By default, she comes in with her hips rotated down like Dr. Riga was talking about. And frankly, for this walk on our contact poses, that seems to be even more clear when I rotated the body down a little bit. Another thing she talked about were the adaptations we have as bipeds that help keep our center of gravity efficiently centered over our core. One of the things she talked about was the shape of the thorax being compressed like a jelly bean as opposed to a barrel in some of our animal ancestors. And another thing was just talking about the broadening of the hips and uh, making sure that when we do do a weight shift, it's an efficient way of doing the weight shift. This gets back to what I was talking about before we broke away with the tracking of the feet, of where those feet are placed underneath the center of the body to make sure that when we are shifting our weight, that we're doing so efficiently. I've gone through and corrected that with Stella here, and I just brought her feet in a little bit closer so that when she's taking a stride, they're coming in very close in the X translation here when she's going through her pass pose. And even here in her contact pose, they're closer together in X. 
so that when she's, again, when she's going side to side, she doesn't have as far to go. The other thing that I really was intrigued by was that lateral stability complex, that set of muscles that helps stabilize our pelvis so it doesn't sag or get off kilter as quickly as it might without that lateral stability complex. Dr. Regan went so far as to say that that was the hallmark of humanity. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so I went through here and on my past poses, I've had, I am trying to indicate that here. So as her leg is swinging through, the hip dips down just, just a little bit over the swinging leg because we know that lateral stability complex is doing its job by not letting it go way down. And it's also indicating some weight by pushing the, uh, the hip bone over the supporting leg up. That pressure is giving an indication of weight as uh, her body is compressing on top of the supporting leg. Dr. Riga also talked about how the curvature of the spine is an adaptation for upright posture. She'll be going into more details about that in a latter part of the lecture. But just for now, let's think about it in terms of how we can loosen up that spine in order to get that contraposta feel and give it some asymmetry to give it balance. We've started to do that by dipping the hip down over the swing through leg and putting a twist in the upper body in opposition with the hips. Finally, what she went into a lot of detail about was that locking knee. So I've tried to really <laughs> make sure that that knee is locked for at the very least two frames going through here. All I have in here are just those really rough poses of the contact and the passing right now. But I did take the time to go through and work on that so that the, the locking knee is really clear there. So here we have Stella so far. Pretty clunky, pretty rough still, but that's just with a really rough contacts and pass pose. I have gone ahead and put the uh, extremes in here, and this should all seem pretty familiar to you guys from not only if you were with us for class one with Bali, but also what's going on with the uh, path of motion with the hips should remind you a lot about the bouncing ball, a lot like what Tom Gibbons was saying earlier in this presentation today. So just to review, these are just tw simple 12 frame steps. I have a key uh, every 12 frames and then the breakdown or the pass pose on frame six. And then I just went in here and did the extremes. So between the contact and the pass is the extreme down. Between the pass and the contact, we have the extreme up. And that's about as far as we're going to go for this particular lecture. Next week, we're going to pick back up with Dr. Riga, who's going to go into a lot more detail about how the hips function and also about how the leg functions as kind of like an oar when you're rowing. Um, it should be a really promising lecture, and I think it will help us bring this walk to the next pass of our blocking. We'll see you next time.